say many thanks for letting me talk today. And um, yeah, I think I, I, if I cannot answer the questions, I will just direct them to Paul in, in the hope that his, his line doesn't collapse. So I'm leading the Secretariat for the Conservation of Great Apes Grass. And here we have many partners, venue from UN Secretariats, UNESCO and UNEP, Great Ape Range States, um, NGOs, multilateral environmental agreements, such as the Convention on Biological Diversity, Convention on Migratory Species, CITES, IUCN, non-range states or donor governments, and private sector. And we are all united in our mandate and aim to conserve great ape populations and habitats. Hmm. So where do we find, uh, find great apes? I think, no, I, have, I have found the, the correct models. So in Africa, the widest ranges with the chimpanzees. Chimpanzees are found in most of Western equatorial Africa, all the way between Southeastern um, Senegal and the Albertine Rift. And you can see it in green on, on the screen. We have two species of gorillas, the Eastern and the Western gorilla. They are separated geographically. The Eastern gorilla is split into the mountain gorillas and the Eastern lowland gorillas. You can see that on that little map on the left side and the Western gorilla, we have the Western lowland gorilla and the cross river gorilla. So the Western lowland gorillas are shown in orange and uh, the cross river gorillas, they, um, they inhabit a very, very small habitat just on the border between Nigeria and Cameroon. And finally, we have the bonobos in Africa, south of the Congo river. So we have great apes in Asia too. Or in Utan, they're only found on two islands, Borneo and Sumatra. In Sumatra, we have two species, the Sumatran orang Utan and uh, the Tapanuli orang Utan, which was just recently discovered. In Borneo, we have three subspecies. So most of our work in GRASP is centered around minimizing the threats to great apes and ensuring that great ape populations um, can survive. So at the request of the society's secretariat, we developed a report together with the IOC and private specialist group section on great apes on the status of great ape populations and their habitats. And the three direct, main direct threats to great apes include habitat loss, disease, and poaching and illegal trade in live animals. Unfortunately, only one subspecies of great apes increased in numbers. And these are the mountain gorillas. 40 years back in the early 80s, we had only around 250 mountain gorillas left in the Virunga Massif and maybe around the same number in Windy. Now we have more than 600 mountain gorillas in the Virunga Massif and more than 400 in uh, wind impenetrable forests. So we have a total population of a little bit over 1,000 now. Doesn't sound much, but definitely a conservation success story. Most often people think that the mountain gorillas are the most endangered great apes, but it's actually the cross river gorilla between Cameroon and Nigeria with less than 300 individuals. And they are even fragmented in several populations. And then we have the newly discovered Tapanuli orang Utan also less than 800 individuals on the island of Sumatra. So what are the threats to great apes? I'm just giving you a few examples. That's a large scale palm oil plantation. So uh, just a, a good indicator for land conversion into agro industrial areas as uh, the photo is taken in Sabah, uh, Malaysia. Sometimes conversion happens at a smaller scale. That's a photo from Ivory Coast in the close neighborhood of the Thai National Park. And that was uh, for slash and burn agriculture. Uh, that photo was taken in Northern, in the Northern Republic of Congo. Um, 
that was taken at the time when we had a project with uh, Paul Telfer in Urban and Doki National Park. So unfortunately, we have new road development. These roads open up the forest. It facilitates trade. And here's just a good example of uh, a hunter, wild meat hunter. You see the gun. You can also see the bags. They're full of wild meat. Sometimes a byproduct of wild meat hunting, sometimes separated because it's a, it's, a, it's a highly commercial and organized trade. Uh, that photo was taken uh, in Eastern Dia Congo in a primate sanctuary, and those chimpanzees were um, confiscated by the National Park authorities. And finally, Great apes, our closest relatives, a lot of the diseases which affect us humans are also affecting great apes. Ebola causes mortality rates of up to 90, 95% in gorillas. So it's a deadly disease for humans and for great apes. So why do I talk about climate change today? Well, I will try to explain to you that this is a new threat and there are many things we, are not un we have not understood yet. And maybe you might think that climate change is more affecting the very um, northern parts of the world, the polar bears and the Arctic, or it might hit more the semi-arid and arid areas in Africa. But I'm trying to explain to you that climate change is, no, is now felt almost everywhere. And I would start with an old photo. Um, I started my career about 30 years ago and, that, and I took that photo in the early 90s in um, southern Uganda. And we had many early mornings and there was fog over the fields. And that was very important because during the dry season, that fog gave additional humidity. Important, um, important for agriculture, important for the biodiversity. That has changed tremendously since then. We have observed longer dry spells and a lot of those areas the swamps have been converted and the fog is not there anymore. It's the same. And that has an impact. The local people need drinking water. When the dry season is too long, often the people have to go into the forest. So the, um, the neighboring communities go into the national park and look for drinking water. But at the same time, more people into the forest means also more disturbance for the gorillas. And obviously, we have more erratic rainfall, an increase in mudslides and flooding, and we also have longer dry periods. So those two photos were taken in um, southwestern Rwanda. So last year, Joanna Cavallo and a number of co-authors published a very interesting paper they're predicting range shifts of African apes under global change scenarios. So what they actually did is they took the climate change scenarios developed under the UN framework for climate change, and then looked how does it affect the different great ape species in Africa. And they had three main conclusions in their paper. Massive range decline is expected by 2050, but range gain is uncertain as African elves will not be able to occupy these new areas immediately due to their limited dispersal capacity. Also, Africa's current protected area network is likely to be insufficient for preserving suitable habitats and maintaining connected ape populations. And when they looked at the different species and subspecies, they also predict that gorillas are most likely to be more affected than chimpanzees because they are more restricted in their behavior flexibility to cope with temperature variation. And I'm just showing you a few examples. So the photos of those chimpanzees were taking Mahale Mountains in Tanzania. So that's a mountain massif very close to Lake Tanganyika. And because of the altitude, the mountains get a bit more rain. So I call them the happy chimpanzees. It's a bit colloquial, but you see it's a nice and rich habitat.
Now compare this to the border area between Senegal and Guinea. We are up in the Futa Jalon and we look down to the lowlands and temperature down there reach up to 47 degrees. We don't see much because the Hamatan is blowing from the Sahara. I never thought before going there that chimpanzees would be able to survive in such an extreme habitat. It's just an, it's just an um, indication that chimpanzees um, live in a, in a great diversity of habitats and they are quite flexible in their behavior and can adapt to different climate zones. So now I want to zoom in into one species. Um, you remember the uh, Carvalho paper there looking at global climate models and looked at a very large scale as uh, at great ape species and subspecies. We want to take a closer look at the mountain gorillas. And for two reasons. One is, is a very limited habitat. It is difficult to break down the global climate model to a more localized climate, which also takes into account the altitudinal gradient. And second, Martin gorillas have not much space to move anywhere else because human population pressure is so high. So we have two mountain gorilla population. One uh, the southern population is in the Virungas, an area shared by Uganda, Rwanda, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. The northern population is in Brindi impenetrable forest, and it extends just a little bit into the Dia Congo, which is a Rambo reserve. And please just remember the shape of those two national uh, of these national parks. And when you now look at a satellite photo and the dark green, you see that basically the park boundary is identical with the forest cover. There's no forest cover outside the protected areas. And, and you see and you see very clearly, very difficult to connect the two populations. But let's now um, get a bit closer to the Mount Gula habitat. That's an old photo, was taken also 25 years ago in southwestern Uganda. You look over the border, you see the uh, Muavura, the big volcano in front, to be followed by Mgahinga and Sabinho. And the three countries meet on the top of Sabinho. But what you see here already is dense human population and agriculture even up to the top of the hills. So here you can see that there is no connection between the two mountain gorilla population. And that connection was already lost a long time ago. Now we move over to the Rwandan side. That photo was taken at around 2,700 meters. And you see there's no buffer zone. You have the forest and you have the, um, the agricultural areas. That photo is from southwestern Uganda, wind impenetrable forest. And here we do have a buffer zone between the park and the human settlements um, so that we can minimize disturbance for gorillas and also reduce human wildlife conflict. But it's not that easy. These photos are from IGCP. These are not my own photos, but it shows very nicely that the gorilla uh, was found in a banana plantation. That's clearly not what we want. So buffer zone management is really important, but in many cases, there's no space for a buffer zone. Gorilla tourism is very important for Rwanda and Uganda, and partly even for the Dia Congo. It brings in important resources for the national park authorities to maintain their services, to operate, to fund other national parks. It also brings in enormous resources for the communities because the communities uh, benefit twice. They get something like a dividend from the sale of the gorilla trekking permit and the park entry permit, and they obviously also get jobs in the tourism industry. So you want to look um, more closely into the impact of climate change and mountain gorillas. And we partner with the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology and with the Dine for Sea Gorilla Fund. 
and we looked at old and historic data in both the Virungas and wind impenetrable forests. And we were absolutely surprised to see that um, higher day temperature or maximum temperature led to an increase in water drinking in mountain gorillas. That was super surprising because we all, we, we all thought that gorillas meet the entire water requirements from their diet. So you might think that this is just a, just a marginal result, but it's actually not because it means that when gorillas have to use open water sources more frequently, they are also more exposed to parasites and um, human diseases. And also, mountain gorilla habitat is not um, homogeneous. Some gorilla families might have easier access to water sources than others. So we don't know whether that would lead to um, um, intraspecific competition. But probably even more scary is the fact that um, climate change also has an impact on the communities. And now I'm going to talk a bit more about the indirect impacts of climate change on mountain gorillas. And I would start with the pandemic. Uh, you have two um, graphics on that slide. On the left side, uh, we mapped the visitors to wind impenetrable forest between 2015 and 2021. And um, when you look at the last bar in 2020 and 2021, you see that we had a very sharp reduction in tourism, in tourism numbers, a catastrophic decline in tourism numbers because of the lockdowns and also suspension to tourism operations. At the same time, we also looked at uh, the le um, illegal activities in wind impenetrable forest. And um, in June, July, 2020, we had a sharp increase. And that was exactly when tourism was suspended between March and late July, early August. What it means basically is that a lot of people in the communities lost their jobs and at the same time, the dividend from um, gorilla tracking permits didn't come in. So the communities were desperate and they were going into the forest. And actually we lost the silver back in late 2020 20 in Uganda, because people went into the forest, they were hunting for wild meat, but they bumped into a gorilla group and felt threatened and killed the silverback. We didn't have such an event for, since 2009, I think, so for a very long time. So it doesn't mean that the local people don't appreciate the gorillas anymore, they're just desperate. And I'm mentioning this because we believe that climate change has an impact on local livelihoods. People don't know what to what to plant anymore or which um, crops to grow because climate has become erratic. And um, we're actually now doing a study on the impact of climate change on local livelihoods and agricultural, agricultural productivity. Now I want to move a little bit back from, uh, from Eastern Africa and go back into Central Africa. And we are just starting in a few weeks, a new project uh, with the um, FAO and with funding from the German International Climate Initiative on conservation and sustainable management of the Congo peatlands. You, you might think that the world in Central Africa is still perfect, still large forest, still pristine areas. But when I um, spoke to Paul and his team, it turned out that even years ago, there were early indications that that climate is changing. There's no proper climate and water mo uh, monitoring system in place yet. So we want to look into um, climate and water monitoring, and we want to assist the countries in land use planning. And I will explain a little bit about uh, why that we feel that this is important. But let us zoom into the area first. So when we talk about the Congo peatlands, we talk about peatlands in the two Congos and they have an estimated cover or size of 145,000 square kilometers. That's pretty much the size of England. And that area contains an estimated 30 gigatons of carbon. And this is equivalent of two years of global greenhouse gas emissions. And it might be even more because that estimation was based on a first study done by the University of Leeds and, our, and the consortium. And they just looked at the extension of the peat lens. Now they're also looking into the depth of the peat. And um, it's very likely that even the um, 
carbon storage is much higher. At the same time, the same area contains the highest densities of water, uh, Western lowland gorillas in the world. And on the DRC side, we have bonobos. We also have chimpanzees and forest elephants. So our project, the pillions are much larger, but our project will just focus on Lactel and Lactumba. And you can see the blue line in the, in the graphic on the left, that's the Congo River. So basically that landscape, it's a transboundary landscape, but it's separated by the Congo River. And you can see from, uh, from the aerial photos, it is a river, it's big. But I also want to show you some more photos from the larger landscape so that you get an understanding that these are very remote areas and partly still pristine. That's a photo from the, um, from the Zanga River. Uh, we were going up to Norban and Doki where WCS is managing the national park. Beautiful morning, foggy, wet. Here and there you find people floating down the river they're coming from Cameroon. It might take them up to three months to reach down the Congo River. So very remote areas. And obviously they're gorillas. When you look carefully, you even see that the Western gorilla is slightly different from the Eastern gorilla. You see a little bit of red hair on, uh, on the head and also the extension of the silver stripe is a bit larger than what you find in the Eastern gorillas. And you might remember this gentleman, Paul Telfer. So Paul made sure that the gorillas were cooperative, but I can assure you it was me handing the camera. And Paul also made sure that we were all behaving and wearing masks to reduce the risk of disease transmission from humans to, to the gorillas. And now I want to show you some photos from another gorilla group much further south in the Lossi interzone. And you can see that this silverback is quite a distance away from me. And that's a, at the time that group was semi habituated and that silverback didn't want me to cross that log. And um, I think it's pretty obvious who has priority in the forest. So the area of the peatlands, it's also an area where we find bonobos. That's from the Dia Congo, a few photos. So you have seen that still many landscapes within, this, um, within the Congo Basin are still relatively intact and pristine. But our fear is that this can change very soon. And I'm just referring to a publication by Bill Lawrence from 2015. So Bill mapped 22 um, development corridors south of the Sahara. And some of those are basically transecting Central Africa. Historically, there was never a connection between the northern side of the forest and the southern side. There was never a road. But now opening up those areas that might have a massive impact on the larger landscape, it might facilitate migration of people, but also all kinds of uncontrolled development. 
So the, the other main objective of our project is to assist the two Congos in land use planning at local level, provincial district level, and national level. And we really will, will be trying to get all the relevant ministries to the table to agree and to agree on a sustainable pathway to development. We don't want to prevent those countries from development, but want to make sure that it's sustainable and also good for biodiversity and the climate. So I want to take you also on a little trip to Asia because we also did a climate study there and we feel that that might have an impact on Africa because a lot of the development we have seen in Indonesia and in Malaysia comes to Africa, but with a certain delay, but often it's just the same companies being involved. So we um, published a report on the future of the Borneo orang utan impacts of changes in land use cover and climate. Just to, to um, recall, we find orang utans on the islands of Sumatra and Borneo, the northern part of Sumatran island, and then in many parts of Borneo, but um, Borneo is changing very, very fast and many forests have been lost over the past 20 years. And, and yes, one of the problems is the expansion of palm oil production. On Utans have lost many of their habitats. Some of them end up in illegal trade. Those photos are taken from a rescue center in central Kalimantan on Borneo. And the lucky ones, they get um, released into a semi-natural environment. That's an island a river island where they have found a new home. So what we did in our study, we tried to predict suitable habitat for orangutans along three timelines, current, 2050 and 2080. So when you look at the graph, you see the current suitable habitat for orangutans in gray. And you can see that still a lot of that habitat is in lowland areas, not far from the ocean. In 2050, there will be much less left for orangutans. And you cannot see it clearly, but most of these light green areas are in the mountains. And by 2080, the suitable habitat will be even smaller and even higher up in the mountains. But the second result is, re is, um, is really scary. We also try to predict what would be suitable palm oil uh, areas for palm oil production in 2050 and 2080. And it turned out that with an increasing temperature, and that's what the global models predict for Borneo, palm oil production might go up the hills. But it's actually the mountains where we have a stronghold of the orangutans. So if we assume that those um, population would be safe in the future under a changing climate and the changing land use and changing land use, we run a big risk of losing, uh, losing even more orangutans. So we have to integrate that perspective into our conservation action planning. So I haven't spoken much about the link between climate change and disease. So I was one of um, UNEP's authors on a joint report with Ilri on preventing the next pandemic, zoonotic diseases and how to break the chain of transmission. And in that report, we concluded that there are seven main drivers that are most likely driving the emergence of zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic diseases are those, these are diseases which are transmitted from animals to humans. And as you can see, number seven, climate change is one of the main drivers. I'm just giving you one example. A lot of you have heard about Ebola, a deadly disease affecting humans and great apes equally. It was um, first time described in uh, the DR Congo and in South Sudan in 1976. 
Since then, we have seen a number of outbreaks, but usually very deep in the forest in remote forest communities, Ebola came fast, it was deadly, it killed and it disappeared. And it re-emerged years later or hundreds or thousands of kilometers away. But what we have observed over the past, let's say since 2005 basically is that there were Ebola outbreaks in areas which were outside the dense forest cover. There were outbreaks in, in Northeastern Congo, but those areas are deforested. The big outbreak in West Africa goes back to an incidents in Guinea, but that's a forest savanna mosaic, a different habitat. And we don't know what the driver is behind this. Is it land and cover change? Is it climate? Probably a combination of the two. So much more uh, research is needed, but we have to watch the impact of climate and there's clearly um, a link to many diseases and an increasing uh, increasing temperatures in Africa in some areas in um, conjunction with um, additional rainfall. And that's, uh, that's a prediction in southwestern Uganda. That can also um, facilitate emergence of existing and new, um, and new diseases. So what do we learn from all this? One is it is really difficult to develop a local climate model especially for mountain areas, and to assess the impact of climate change. I would love to, to present more results, but actually the research is going on and uh, we are working with the Woodwell um, Climate Research Center, and they are translating a global climate model into a local climate model for uh, the Virungas and Wind Impenetrable Forest, and they're also looking into the socioeconomic impacts. So there are direct and indirect impacts of climate change on great apes. And it's also important to, um, to note that many threats are correlated, the same as I said with illegal trade. Often um, you, um, they're confiscations, but the people who um, uh, captured great apes were often bushmeat hunters and it's a byproduct because um, um, the gorilla family or the chimpanzee, chimpanzee family was killed. The same with, um, with the impact of climate change. It's often the secondary impact which might have the biggest impact on great apes because communities are struggling with their livelihoods and they go into the forest and that might increase illegal activities. What it means is that we really have to include climate change in species conservation action planning. And, you might know, and that might also mean that we have to rethink our protected area network. So I want to stop here so that we have sufficient time for a discussion, but I hope that um, humans and great apes both have a future on the changing um, land use um, cover and the changing climate. Thank you. Before people start asking questions, because I think there's probably a lot of questions, I just want to say thank you to Johannes, because you know not only is he part of the scientific community that's doing all this work, but he's also one of the rare individuals who's capable of mobilizing donors to support the projects out into the field. And Johannes has been incredible over the years supporting these remote sites where people have dedicated their lives to great apes. And without people like Johannes behind the scenes, making sure to connect like LCA does, connecting people and accelerating and making things happen. Um, it just wouldn't be possible. And I would just like to thank him now for all the work he's done and the dedication he's put over the years. So thank you, Johannes. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> no, it needs both. I mean, it's a, it needs a connection to the donor community, but it also needs committed individuals and organizations working there. And we know that conservation is a long-term commitment and um, I think WCS just signed a new agreement with Noah Bali and Doki, and it's for another, I don't know, 20 years. But um, I mean, we have to, lo to look along very long time horizons and the permanent pressure bringing money because at the end, we have to pay people, we have to pay communities, we have to continue our work. And um, I'm, um, 
uh, I mean, we, we just had a discussion today. I mean, uh, what is happening in Europe right now will probably have an impact on fundraising and on, and on all of us because there are other priorities in Europe right now. But that's where a lot of funding for us is coming from, especially for Central Africa. Yeah. That's great. Well, at least we have people fighting, and that's what counts. Thank you, Paul. You are over to you. Questions and answers. Thank you, Chris. Um, everybody, as usual, you are welcome to use the reaction tools at the bottom of the screen to um, attract our attention, or please write your questions in um, the chat, and we will get to you as soon as possible. Okay, I, I, I remember last week, it may, really made an impression of me what um, Prof. Liesel von us said, is that we're not communicating effectively and therefore there are no change. And I feel that this kind of presentation where there's this mix of science and artistic photos was quite effective. Um, and, you know, you did the, the strange thing of remaining quiet. I think it's the first person that had a presentation here that could remain quiet because the images were so effective that we could just appreciate your images, to me in any case, incredible yeah. photography. Um, I see there's a comment in the chat from uh, Nicolette van Brakel. Um, I visited Rwanda in 2003 and especially went to see the gorillas. One of the most awesome experiences of my life. Wonderful presentation, but certainly concerning. My question, what can I do as an individual sitting in my home in South Africa to help save the great apes? Many things. <laughs> I, I think with ape conservation, I mean, it's something where, where we can all um, get engaged. Um, we are also consumers. I mean, we buy products. Um, and I think consumer behavior has an impact on, on companies. So um, one example is um, palm oil. I'm, I'm not, I'm not um, lobbying for a ban on palm oil, but what we can do is we can try to understand whether it comes from uh, sustainable resources. They are certified palm oil products. Um, some, uh, there's some efforts in having a barcode that you can actually check where it comes from. There's also um, an online tracking tool. Um, I think it's called, um, uh, by, yeah, developed by the Zoological Society of London. Mm. And uh, you can go on the website and you can see whether the palm oil companies registered under the round table for sustainable palm oil are actually sticking to their commitments or whether they are violating um, the, the principles. So I think consumer behavior is one thing. Um, we always have that discussion between climate and biodiversity. Um, I, I, I believe that when you visit the, the gorillas or the chimpanzees, and you do it responsibly. There are no efforts in certifying uh, mountain gorilla tourism. It's a joint project of the International Gorilla Conservation Program and the Wildlife Friendly Enterprise Network. So first you can make sure that you, are, um, that you book something which is sustainable and it's certified. And also you, um, I mean, you bring very important resources to the park, to the parks and the people. I do know that when you travel long distances that obviously we also have a carbon footprint, um, but um, tourism can be responsible and tourism can play an important role, uh, can play an important role in um, bringing in the necessary resources for conservation. Thank you, Johanna. I see there's a, also a comment and a question by Andy Klee. What gives you optimism for the future of great apes, Johannes? Well, unfortunately, it's only one subspecies which has increased over the years. But I mean, when, when I started, we never thought that uh, mountain gorillas would survive in, um, because we saw that massive pressure from the surrounding communities. I mean, we, we basically talk about landscapes which have 600, 650 people per square kilometer. There's not much land left. And I think, retrospectively, the fact that we have um, developed mountain gorilla tourism and clear benefits for the communities, for the governments, for the countries um, have, have helped to, um, to, save, to, to save the mountain gorillas. Obviously, you cannot just translate that same model to other areas. Tourism needs investment. It's not always feasible. Um, and um, that's maybe a topic for another call, um, um, for another talk. Um, I think we have to diversify. The pandemic has shown us that an over-dependency on tourism is a problem. 
and we should be looking to wildlife credits and conservation trust funds and carbon credits and carbon credits and premiums for biodiversity and 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 i mean it's um there are many approaches but i i hope and i mean we, we have to be optimists otherwise we can't do our job but i hope that uh, we can we can make great ape conservation a viable lively option for communities because at the end the people living with wildlife in our case with great apes they need a future they also have to pay their bills i think it's very simple they have to pay school bills and medical bills so if they do not benefit from the wildlife and they are sharing the same landscape it will be very difficult indeed um, I see from Claudia Roth in the chat as well. Do you think that it would possible that it would be possible to buy a land, especially around the Virungas, with donations or perhaps an increase in fees for tourists? Um, so there were um, there was actually um, a number of foundations invested in a land purchase program in the um, mid and late nineties. Um, around um, Buenin Penetrable Forest, and some of that area is still a buffer zone. So it has helped to minimize um, disturbance and pressure on, on the mountain gorillas. Now we have so many more people living there that it's very difficult. Um, there's an attempt um, by the Rwandan government to expand uh, the Virunga Park, and um, that obviously also needs um, significant resources. It's it's pro it's probably a combination mm -hmm. uh, sure. of um of of activities um expanding buffer zones and at the same time looking into the diversification of economic activities. But um land land is a scarce resource. It's not like other areas in Africa. Here we really have high human population pressure, and um, basically we have we have communities who entirely, almost entirely depend on uh, agriculture. Yeah, difficult situation. Thanks, Johannes. Um, Claudia, did that answer your question? Would you like to add anything? Oh, oh sorry, tourism fees. I forgot the second part. Okay, uh, yeah, this one I can, I can, I hope I can answer. Um, because now um, the Martin Gorilla range states have applied uh, a slightly different approach to the to the fee structure. Um, Rwanda increased the um, the tracking permits from seven hundred fifty dollars to fifteen hundred um, a couple of years ago. And before the pandemic, they actually had very good booking rates. So they maximized the income without increasing the number of tickets. Uh, Uganda State uh, with the seven hundred fifty dollars per person and also had um, discounts for. Uh, for local and regional tourism and even had um, seasonal tickets and both approaches were were successful. Um, years ago, we actually did a market study and we saw that a thousand dollars would be the the top uh, the cup and we shouldn't be higher. Rwanda went to 1500 and has shown that it actually worked. I do not know how much flexibility is there to increase further. Um, and I'm not aware of any market study which has looked into this. Um, during the pandemic, prices went down and Rwanda has gone back again to 1500, but it does offer discount rates for tourists who also um, promise to visit the other two national parks in the country. And I think it's too early, it's a relatively new scheme to, to analyze um, what, the, um, what the return is, whether um, they basically earn the same amount of money in comparison to before the crisis and the pandemic. Thank you Thanks, very much. Mark. And gre greetings from Frankfurt. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Claudia. Uh, Marty, please go ahead and ask your question. You got to meet, you got to unmute, Marty. It wasn't being offered, but now it is. Thanks, guys. Um, thanks, Johannes, for the very interesting talk. and. The um, photographs were breathtaking, to be honest. You, uh, temptation to go and visit is huge. Um, I, I think often we have a, um, an African bias um, because we are Africans and South Africans and, in general, but 
which which area is actually in a worse um, situation, the Asian um, uh, Indonesian uh, orangutans or the, the 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 gorillas in Africa? From my from what I'm seeing and uh, it kind of in terms of just numbers and habitat pressure. Um, it seems to be the Asian, but maybe if you can sort of talk about which one's in a worse um, state and um, possibly not going to come back um, as easily, um, because I think the, the habitat destruction in, in the Asian areas is just huge. Yeah, when, when, you, when you look at um, sub, um, subspecies level or species level, I mean, the two, real, the two populations really at risk at the moment is a cross river gorilla between Cameroon and Nigeria, simply because there's so few individuals left, left, left uh, less than 300, and also fragmented into several populations. And again, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge human population pressure because it's also these fertile highlands. It's a rain and it's a volcanic soils, and that's just very good for agriculture. It's a, it's a bit different uh, in, in Asia. Um, the most endangered is the Tapanuni. We have less than 800 individuals and uh, the Sumatran government is building a hydro dam and with all the associated infrastructure, um, that um, population and that species is at high risk. Um, if I look at the larger scale very clearly, the rate at, wi at, wi at which we lose habitat in Asia is just mind blowing. It's, it's terrible. It's, I mean, I could not believe until I actually went there and was in a little plane and flew over the area. I mean, you, you can drive in a car for five, six, seven hours and you see nothing else than palm oil plantations. And that was all rainforest before. I could not believe it until I went there. Is, is that reversible? I mean, do the governments almost not care? I mean, is tourism not bringing in enough money to compete against those land uses? Or what, what, what's the main reason that it's just continuing unabated? Um, do the, surely the governments actually care about their own natural heritage. It's, it's, it's complex. I mean, uh, for a long time, the business model was um, basically an illegal contract with the private sector. And uh, the money they got from selling the locks, they invested directly into the palm oil plantation. So it was basically a zero investment business model. Um, also, palm oil is incredibly... Um, productive and, and generates the highest yields in vegetable oils. So, um, and um, we find palm oil in almost all products, industrial products, cosmetics, um, food. So there's a market, there's even increasing market demand. It's easy to produce. And, um, and even uh, when you look at the socioeconomy, when, when you actually go to the people, I mean, we have lost biodiversity and they see a change in climate, but they they will also tell you we have jobs and we can pay our school bills. Mm. So it's a, it's a, it's a very, um, very complex picture. When you really go to the communities, you get a lot of positive answers. And they're saying, well, uh, we, we got infrastructure, we got schools, we, have, we get clinics and we can pay our bills. So that's, that's very difficult. Um, I, I think that the future is um, certification, direct in palm oil development to degraded lands. We also did a study on this to indicate which lands are suitable for palm oil, but are degraded lands, and there's no collision with um, biodiversity conservation. But um, I think the issue here is that often on the degraded lands, you have many landowners, and compensation schemes take a lot of time and are expensive, and companies try to avoid. And what we have seen more recently is that even the, um, the big companies are become a bit more careful because the, the global world is watching them, but it's the communities deforesting. Mm. And some is even community land. And um, they develop the palm oil plantations, but they have a guarantee market because it's the big companies behind. But it's very difficult to criticize when communities are clearing their own forest. Mm. And, and then and maybe, oh, yeah, maybe one final word, um, Malaysia and Indonesia are quite different, I mean, very different countries. Um, so Malaysia has lost most of its forests. There's very little left, but the little which is left, they protect relatively well, mm. but 90% is gone. In, in Indonesia, there's still much more forest left, but they still keep losing. 
and they're not well protecting their protected areas. So that's a little bit a different scenario at the moment. And, and are any like World Heritage sites or UNESCO sites or anything like that on the cards to try and force it being protected from, you know, internationally or anything like that um, to try and, you know, force, force it to be protected? Yes, I mean, they are, um, they're well known national parks, they are on World Heritage sites. Um, it's, it's at the moment, it's a discussion at very high political level. Um, I mean, um, a lot of the conservation funding is coming from Europe. And at the same time in Europe, there's a, um, there's a discussion within the European Union on um, only allowing import of certified palm oil. And, um, and um, Indonesia and Malaysia have um, taken that case to the World Trade Organization and are arguing that Europe is basically preventing them from development. So it's, um, it's a discriminatory um, proposed or draft bill. Um, we don't know the outcome yet, but it's, um, it's very complex and it's politically um, very, very difficult and sensitive. And is there any way that you can, after it's been planted, actually reverse it with uh, natural, back to indigenous natural and vegetation? Or once it's had uh, the palm oil plantations, that's the end, it's, it's never going to go back? Is it possible? Well, yeah. I see that. Well, it's, um, I mean, that's relatively independent of palm oil. Whenever we convert a, a, a tropical rainforest into uh, an agricultural step here in monoculture, it, uh, it would take hundreds and hundreds of years to bring it back. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, there are some, um, some issues which are really important. In some cases, companies have, have bought land and uh, within the land they have pro uh, procured, there are still step stones and, uh, and intact forest. Unfortunately, the Indonesian law does not foresee that the private sector is managing biodiversity conservation areas. So there are also some partners working on this and trying to um, amend the law or finding ways that private sector with support from uh, the conservation partners can manage those important step stones. Oh, Marty, give me a gap here, please. <laughs> well, thank, thank, you. Up. <laughs> thank you. John, while he's giving you a gap. <laughs> he's on a roll now. Uh, Claudia, you've got a follow-up question. And after that, please, Joanna, I just want to make sure I had to take a phone call, but there is a question in the chat yes. that came from John and Margaret Cooper around legislation. Uh, Johannes just referred briefly to that. we got to get back to that. Over to Claudia. Thanks. Yes, there's just a short question concerning palm oil, because I heard in, in French um, radio that um, Indonesia stopped mm -hmm. or will stop all uh, palm oil exports because they need it for themselves. Is this good or it's a bad sign? What do you think? Um, I think I need to look at the figures because um, China is still a big market for Indonesian palm oil too. And um, that's actually um, the biggest concern I have heard um, from some of our experts saying that um, it's great to discuss sustainability in Europe and to introduce a bill and, and make sure that only certified palm oil can enter European Union. And maybe that encourages other countries to follow. But at the moment, India and China, just when you look at the population, are huge consumers of palm oil and they don't require um, um, certification. Thank you. Thanks, Johannes. So there's an onus on the consumers to, to act responsibly. Yeah. Um, then the question from John and Margaret Cooper, um, do you have to look at legislation and law enforcement in the light of climate change? Hmm. I think we have, but um, in some cases it's very difficult. Um, for example, when communities lose their, lose their harvest just because um, we have flooding or we have droughts and they're really desperate, it's very difficult to prevent them from entering the forest. Yeah. So um, I, think, I think we are, um, when we look, talk about legislation and policy development, I, I just think we have to diversify income. So uh, diversify that there's a safety net when, um, when floods 
and droughts affect, uh, affect the harvest, or when we have a pandemic and tourists are not coming. I, I think at the end of the day, we need to find a model that, uh, that the people living around great ape habitat have an income and have an income which is relatively stable and, um, and even under um, a changing climate uh, can support the communities. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Johannes. Um, next, uh, there are a lot of comments in the chat at the moment, so I'm just going to go through them. Um, Dr. Llewellyn Taylor, thanks, Johannes. The great apps are, much, are such iconic species, so much more really for us as so much more really for us as humans. The realization of the threats they face tends to silence one into deep thought, and that is indeed true. Um, Francisco Mitogo, I all, is it possible to share a synthesis of this, of this meeting? Since the schedule of some is not compatible, we will share the recording of the whole, um, a video of the whole recording on the LCA video uh, YouTube channel. So please look out for it there. Uh, Marit, if you could perhaps just uh, again, share the link to that um, in the chat. And then from John and Margaret Cooper again, is GRASP able to encourage human birth control where appropriate in order to slow the increase in populations in Great App um, territories? Yeah, good, um, good, good question. Um, I think we are to a certain, um, to, uh, yeah, um, somehow victim of our own success because it's not only that the human population around um, the gorilla as a mountain gorilla areas has increased we also have migration because people felt that there are better job opportunities around the mountain gorilla area so we deal with the normal increase in human population plus an increasing migration rate so it makes the problem even bigger and um yeah i think um if we could just stabilize population growth in Africa, that, uh, that would probably be the biggest contribution to um, sustainable development and conservation. Um, we have worked with partners and they promote this in the schools, but um, you know that this is not an easy topic in Africa. Indeed. Um, thanks, Johannes. Um, Marty, you're welcome to come back with questions now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for giving us a gap. I see Dr. Allen Taylor has got a question. Please go ahead. Hi, hi. hi. Uh, thanks, thanks Johannes. Johannes. I just want to ask you a question. You know, there are a lot of climate change, global climate change models floating around at the moment. And I was on a webinar just the other day in which there were some models for climate change around, around the world. And you've clearly got some, some ideas and some evidence there of of the effects in the in the local ranges for 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 the gorillas, um, do you have any evidence? Is it is there any information on on predictions from global from global um, climate change models that might predict what the circumstances might be in, into the future in those ranges, those areas? Um, I, I hope I understood the question correctly because there was an echo in the in the line. Um, yeah, well, I, can I, just repeat, I, I, I can just repeat it quickly. Um, uh, are, are, there, are there any predictions from the climate change, the global models for climate change? Are there any predictions for those particular range, ranges, those particular ranges for the, for the gorillas in terms of what might be uh, happening in, in the future? So, yes. Um, so, look, looking at the global models, there are predictions for Uganda and Rwanda and for the for northwestern Rwanda and southwestern Uganda, the prediction is that the temperatures are rising, but also the rainfall is rising. And what looks like a good good news is not necessarily good news because it also seems that the rain is coming all at one time. So the same time there's more rain, but it's also longer dry season. And this is causing lots of um, challenges for the local population in terms of their agricultural productivity. Um, what we haven't achieved yet is um, to, to factor in the, um, uh, the altitudinal gradient because these volcanoes are very steep. And actually we are at yes. the moment, uh, the Woodwell Research Center, uh, Climate Research Center is looking into this and they try to fine tune that model that we have a bit more 
better information because gorilla habitat is also not um, homogeneous. There are big differences and we try to understand okay. that better. So I, I hope in the next four or five months, we have a bit more evidence. Mm -hmm. Great. Great, thank, thank you. you. Any other questions at the moment? Um, Chris, am I missing anything in the chat, perhaps? Um, Let's see, there's a comment in the chat. John, I, yeah, we can just uh, quickly check this comment. Uh, so there's a comment from Francisco Mitogo. In my country, Equatorial Guinea, the Consumption of palm oil is something related to tradition, although the way of extracting it from the forest does not consist of cutting down the tree, but rather of removing the, the bunch from above the tree and collecting it for preparation. Do you think that this is <clears throat> that this practice is sustainable when dealing with palm oil as a global problem? Thanks. Yes, the oil palm is from uh, Western Central Africa and it has a long tradition and local use has never been the problem. The problem is that the big companies are coming and converting huge tracts of forest into, into plantations. And um, there's some, um, some indication that, for example, it even has a link to diseases. When we had only small scale palm oil plantations, Lassa fever wasn't a huge issue. But it seems that now with the big the expansion of palm oil, the big plantations, Lassa fever is re-emerging. So it's a, it's a very complex topic. Thanks, Johannes. That's very insightful. Um, Leslie Cornish, please go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. And thank you for a really inspiring and also sombering presentation. Um, my question is that you said that the palm oil in Borneo um, is also likely with, with increased temperatures, uh, the plantations are also likely to then occur on the mountains. But isn't it more difficult to, um, you know, to harvest it on the mountains or doesn't it really matter? So I was wondering if one might stop the other because they're, you know, because they're mountains and it might be more difficult. Thank you. I think it depends on the topography. I mean, not all are steep, um, steep mountains. Some are just um, hills. And um, um, what we predicted in that paper is um, that um, in areas there, obviously on the on the um, on the data we used, there are areas which are higher up in the mountains, but still suitable for palm oil production. But at the moment, these are also areas which are important for oil and wood populations. And there's a risk that you're going to lose those areas. Some are so steep and Palmer will never go there. That's true. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Thanks yeah. for your question. Uh, maybe, maybe one more comment on the situation in Africa. We just did recently a study on um, the expansion of vegetable oil in general in Africa. Um, our original thinking was also that it's palm oil being the biggest threat, but it turned out that, that it's a much more um, heterogeneous picture, so that it depends on, on the landscape and the country and um, other agricultural drivers um, can be even more important than palm oil. So that um, we, we really need to rethink a little bit. Palm oil is in all media and has um, received a lot of attention. But uh, at the same time, we seem to have ignored other threats and uh, we will have to a little bit fine tune our strategy. So that was uh, the lesson learned from that report. Thanks, Johannes. Motti, welcome back. Go for it. Uh, uh, Marty, you must yeah. just unmute. Yeah, it only popped up now. Um, yeah, if there's no other questions I'll ask. Um, in terms of those species that are really, um, you know, 300 um, individuals left um, of those uh, specific gorillas, I was just wondering, is there any uh, merit in almost trying to um, get semen and eggs from those um, gorillas and, uh, and freezing them? At least then there's a, a store somewhere if, if it really goes completely wrong 
for maybe the future if if we can sort out the forests or or something like that is there a way that we can preserve them even if they aren't necessarily alive and the numbers go down but at least we've got some viable fertilized eggs or something i don't know if there's a possibility or is that just too expensive i'm, I'm not i'm not aware of any efforts into that direction i mean what, what is giving us a little bit of hope right now is that there's a plan to have a trend it's frozen <laughs> Um, let's give it a moment and see if Johannes returns to us. I think it's frozen like the, the fertilized eggs. <laughs> <laughs> Johannes is back. Johannes, we okay. lost you there for a moment. So if you don't mind repeating your answer, please. Oh, there he goes again. I'm going to um, connect with him now, Johan. Yeah. Thanks, Marit. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to ask a hard question to chase him away. <laughs> <clears throat> Marty, are you uh, volunteering for the harvesting um, mission? <laughs> if, um, if it means that I go and get to see the gorillas and uh, someone pays me to do it, I don't mind giving it a try. <laughs> can, can, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. No, unless you're back. Okay, thank, thank you, great. Um, I'm not of, um, um, aware of those efforts. What is giving us a little bit of hope at the moment is that Nigeria and Kamara are working towards a uh, Transponi World Heritage Site. Um, we have insecurity in Western Cameroon. There's, it's, it's a problem, but at least there's an attempt to, to connect the different um, habitats and also to raise the profile and get the international donors supporting it. So I'm really putting a little bit of um, effort into this and also my hopes. Okay, cool, thanks. Thanks, Johannes. I see there's another uh, comment in the chat from, um, it looks like it's from, uh, sorry, my chat is jumping up and down at the moment, John and Margaret Cooper. Thank you for your informative lecture and especially for the pictures of the Rwanda volcanoes and the mountain gorilla uh, tourist center close to where we lived when we worked to the Centre Veterinaire de Volcan, my French, a very long time ago. Um, Alistair Bird, I unfortunately have to go. Thank you so much. Great talk. William Timoso from Kenya. John, we can unmute him. Oh, no, you said Dr. Um, Llewellyn Taylor first. No, Llewellyn, you were on there. And then William, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Unmute, there we go. I'm still not unmuted. Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I just can't resist this question, Johannes, and I don't know if you could possibly give me an answer to it. You know, this population is small. The, uh, the range is relatively small. Um, are there subpopulations um, that live independently of each other within those ranges, possibly? And the, the, the question is, relates to genetic variation and and um, oh, we could, well, I, could, I could use the term inbreeding, yeah, uh, genetic variation and and, and you know, the drops in the, on the in the levels of genetic variation. Is, is any genetic work being done on those populations? So yeah, there is um, there is genetic work being done on the populations. The Virunga and the um, Brindy population have been separated for a very long um, amount of time, which is a problem. Um, the biggest concern right now is that we have an increasing numbers and we're very proud, but we have increasing numbers in a very confined and restricted habitat. So there's yeah. already some indication that it leads to additional stress and, and competition. And um, we don't, we don't have numbers which clearly say, oh, um, you, you reach carrying capacity um, at 1,100 or 1,300 or 1,000 individuals. We don't know this, but um, I think it's a question we have to investigate and then to see how do we manage an increasing population in a small habitat? Do we want to bring the gorillas somewhere else? What are the options for expanding that, uh, that habitat, which is very small? And also, how do we deal with uh, potential effects of inbreeding and a very reduced gene pool? Okay, thank lots, you. Um, lot, still lots of questions to be answered. 
Uh, sure. Uh, William, please go ahead and ask your question. William, Have I been unmuted? Yes, yes William, I... please go ahead. Oh, well, I just wanted to comment to say, uh, first of all, sorry, I, my network was still a, a challenge, but I could get a lot of uh, information. And this is, this is very interesting and great work that has been done. Uh, I'm not very far from uh, Uganda. I think uh, one of the days I'm going to pay a visit. And thank you very much, Chris, for all this. And it's great. This is, this is really very interesting. My first time on this talk to, to listen through. And uh, thank you, Johan. Thank you, William, and uh, thanks for joining us. Lovely to have you on first time. No, every time. OK. <laughs> OK. <laughs> I've, I've thank even you, met new, new uh, old friends, uh, John and Margaret Cooper. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks, William. We'll stay in touch. You're, well, you're welcome. Thanks, William. Um, any further questions at this stage? Dr. Johannes Refish and the bigger team and all those who are supportive in being present tonight, but at the same time also trying to make a difference as also advised by Johannes. Thanks to all of you. Dr. Refish, we are honored and we thank you and we trust that this is not the last of uh, we joining hands and finding ways to get the message out there. And uh, again, thank you for a very interesting and beautiful discussion, as Johan also said.